Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm joined again by my colleague, friend and return guest on the Hormones in Harmony podcast to talk all about skin rashes for a second time. My guest is Jennifer Fugo, who is a clinical nutritionist empowering women who have been failed by conventional medicine to beat chronic skin and unending gut issues. Because she's overcome a long history of gut issues and eczema, Jennifer has empathy and insight to help her clients discover missing pieces and create doable, integrated plans. Simply put, Jennifer believes that you deserve better. That's why she launched skinsyrup.com to interrupt the failed conversation about chronic skin problems with helpful alternatives that you aren't being told about. She holds a master's degree in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport and is a licensed dietitian nutritionist and certified nutrition specialist. Her work has been featured on Dr. Oz, Reuters, Yahoo, CNN, and many podcasts and summits. Jennifer is a faculty member of the Learn Skin Platform, an Amazon bestselling author, and the host of the Healthy Skin Show. So welcome back, Jennifer. Thank you for having me back. I'm so excited. You're welcome. The conversation is not over. This, I, I no. listened back to the first episode again because this was released back in November 2020, I think. And that was a very in-depth episode. We covered a lot of different subjects. Um, it was a 90-minute one. So I wanted to make sure that we covered some different things. So if anyone is interested, definitely go back and listen. That will be linked in the show notes. But in that episode, we covered more about your skin struggles with eczema and the root causes that you had specifically. The potential issue with food elimination diets and restricting too much, because we've both been there as well. And it's a common thing that we see with our clients. We touched on... Um, two or three of the common root causes because there is I think you said 12 common ones that you see yeah um, so we touched on gut health liver detox pathways and emotional stress trauma during that episode but today I wanted to talk so about some of the other things that people need to know if they're struggling with conditions like eczema psoriasis dermatitis that's what we mean when we're mentioning skin rashes and to start off with the last episode was very holistic, talking about natural solutions, but I think we both agree that there's a time and a place for conventional um, mm -hmm. therapies, things like steroids and antibiotics in some cases. So I wanted to share some information on some of these conventional treatments for if anyone is currently using them just to manage symptoms and just get by or is considering using them and what they need to know. So the first one, the first question is, on your root causes or 12 root causes list that you have, you listed drug reactions or medications as a potential trigger. Which ones are we talking about? So with drug reactions, uh, the ones we'll be talking about today are really the side effects of using topical steroids and, and steroids in general. Um, it can also be through nasal sprays, uh, oral medications, um, and even like prednisone or injections. Sometimes people need um, a steroid injection. But just to kind of like, just a slight aside to that, you can take a drug, like for example, beta blockers, uh, a lot of times are used as like a, a high blood pressure medication, and that can actually be a trigger for psoriasis. So you should look back in your timeline when whatever, with whatever skin condition you have, and also pay attention to, did you start a medication maybe four, six months before the onset because there are some medications that actually can cause issues. Um, you know, today's conversation is, I think it's a really important one to have because I think, as you said, there are pros and cons to taking medication, but you, we, we really need to educate ourselves on what those are so that we can make an educated decision moving forward. And I want to say in all disclosure and in all fairness that I did use topical steroid creams when I had dyshydratic eczema on my hands. I did. I didn't use it a lot. I used it very little. My father, who was a medical doctor, had warned me that I should not rely on it, that I should take it as little as possible and use it as sparingly as possible. I am lucky that I got that recommendation, but most people are not. They're oftentimes prescribed large tubs of steroids and there is sometimes poor direction provided by their practitioner or provider. And there are also times where people become so desperate, they don't know what to do and they continue to apply because they were told to just keep using it. There were no limitations placed on them. And so I'm not a doctor. I'm not here to tell you to start or stop a medication, but I do think that it's important that we have a conversation about steroids because it does have a huge impact, not only on your skin, but also on your adrenal glands. Um, and there can be some serious consequences that 
I have become very passionate about helping to raise awareness around. Um, so that's, that's the main one that I think we should talk about today. And we can also to, um, you know, I do also have some thoughts on biologic drugs as well. So if we want to jump into that after this conversation, I'm happy to, to share those thoughts too. Definitely. And I think people are, or maybe aware of the, um, they call it like thinning skin. So more of like a topical problem that long-term it can cause some um, issues topically, but could you talk a little bit more about that? And then also the internal um, changes that can be made with long-term steroid use or abuse of them. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, thinning skin is absolutely a problem, especially in areas where the skin is already thinner, like your face. So you do have to be careful of the potency of the steroid cream that is prescribed to you. So it's, that's something to really question your doctor on. The reason that skin gets thin is because it the um, steroid actually causes a breakdown and a reduction in production of, of collagen. And it is very difficult to get the thin skin to thicken again after the fact. Especially so, if you're also over the age of 25 and you're aging yes. and your collagen's just on the decline anyway each year. Yeah. So it's a huge problem. You can also end up with skin discoloration. You can end up, especially if you're applying it to your face and around the eyes, you can end up with early cataract formation um, and cataracts. You have to have surgery to have them removed. There is no other option to get rid of them. Uh, you can obviously end up with adrenal imbalances, which we're going to talk about. It can slow down wound healing. It can increase blood sugar and actually accelerate the onset of diabetes. Uh, it can, it weakens your immune system. And that one of the, the main side effects that you'll see when you go online is that it will increase your susceptibility to fungal overgrowth as a result of that. Uh, you can become addicted to them. So that'll be kind of like, ta we'll talk about that in, in regards to the adrenal piece. And it also can cause spider veins. So there's purple, reddish spider veins that a lot of people feel embarrassed about. But those are some of the main side effects that people don't know that it also does deplete certain nutrients and whatnot. I think that's, I would say slightly for me, less of a concern because some of these are pretty serious and involve some pretty heavy, like surgery is a pretty heavy duty intervention of say you do develop cataracts. Would it be right in saying that the side effects are similar to those of like chronic stress? Cause it is like the cortisol um, connection. So it can break down your, your tissues over time. It can deplete your adrenal glands over time. It can cause stress to the body. It can suppress your immune system long-term. So does that, does that make sense? My question, like, is it the same, it does. same it, negative it, things that we hear about with chronic stress? So yes, but it's worse. It is worse on a scale to the fact that it is literally, um, I would say life wrecking. I think that even that comment is an understatement to the, some of the suffering that clients who've gone through this. So what happens is, and this is what a lot of people don't know, and I in fact didn't know this, is that topical steroids, hydrocortisone is actually cortisol. It is man-made cortisol that you're applying to your skin. And with time, because you have this exogenous or external application of cortisol, your adrenal glands start to feel like essentially they don't really have to do what they're supposed to do because there is cortisol there, but it's coming from some other source. So they start to become lazy. And so there is no clear timeline here. There is no clear amount that you of steroids you can use. Everyone is different, but there is this point, this unclear tipping point where your body literally becomes addicted to the steroids. And so, yes, I realize that prednisone is not the same as hydrocortisone, but using prednisone can also cause issues with your adrenal glands, like stepping down too quickly off of prednisone can cause some serious adrenal issues. So this is sort of similar, but it's something that can creep up over years. It also is not necessarily specific to people who have rashes. So if you are a parent and you are applying the creams to your child, it could apply to you because you have that exposure. The cortisol is absorbed through the skin. And what happens in that sense, so your body starts to become addicted. And then the rashes, which let's just say, for example, you had um, eczema or psoriasis on one arm. Well, the rashes start to spread and the skin becomes extremely red burning, extremely itchy. 
um, it starts to take over your whole body like a wildfire does. You begin to have difficulty controlling your temperature. Um, so you may be extremely overheated or extremely cold. You cannot contr control or regulate your body temperature. Your hair will start to fall out. You will develop insomnia. Your um, lymph nodes will begin to swell. Um, and a lot of times I've had clients that are tested for all sorts of really random, weird, rare genetic diseases because doctors don't know what's going on. And ultimately they end up giving them more steroids because they're like, well, this must just be a severe form of eczema. And it's really not. It's your body literally freaking out because it can no longer maintain the status quo. Your immune system is trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Sometimes this will happen when people also stop long-term steroid use, um, steroid cream use. They'll be like, you know what? I don't want to use this anymore. And this can also sometimes happen, but essentially what this is called is topical steroid withdrawal. Sometimes you'll see it online as TSW or topical steroid addiction. And it's not currently at the date of this recording, a diagnosable condition. It was very recently recognized in Britain by their, your dermatologic society that this is an actual problem. And then after that, a few weeks later, our um, more, I would say, national, so it was National Eczema Association finally recognized, they've known about it for a long time. I had conversations with um, them for about this for a while. So they've known about it, but no one really wanted to come out. There's no diagnosis codes in the United States. It's still viewed as some either thing that women talk about on the internet that's in your head. Um, or it's severe eczema. And that's basically how it is viewed from the conventional model right now. And as I said, unfortunately, it's just giving you more steroids, which doesn't actually fix the problem. It makes it worse. And so it is horrifying what some people go through emotionally, mentally, physically, the exhaustion, um, it's, it's pretty severe. And so I'm not sharing any of this to frighten anyone who is using steroids in their journey. I did not develop TSW. There are many people who do not. Um, there is one important factor here. If this has happened to you and you believe that as you're listening to this, um, there are some resources out there. There's a documentary that you can watch for free on YouTube called Preventable. And so that might also be helpful, but you do need to make sure that what you're experiencing is not a staph infection. So a staph infection will oftentimes look the same. And so it's crucial that you get a skin culture done to identify that, don't, no, this is not a staph infection. This is something else. Um, and it's also important to know that if you do develop TSW, that A, it's, it's really not your fault. Um, I think we, there's a lot of emotions, there's grieving, there's anger, there's a lot of things that you go through because you feel betrayed by your doctors and all sorts of things. And there's also not a lot of help out there for it. Unfortunately, I, I'm happy to talk about some of the resources and things that I do in my practice. And there are some, there are, there are some practitioners that understand it, but not very many. Um, there's no exact protocols at this point in time either. We're still in the midst of trying to figure out how to support people through this process. It can take anywhere from months to years, like sometimes up to five years to overcome and get your body re-regulated. Um, and it's, it is, um, it is, uh, it's challenging because a lot of people don't understand. They didn't know that your body could become addicted to topical steroid cream. Yeah, I mean, if, do and, if conventional doctors don't think it's or think it's a real thing, then they're not going to get the warning before starting them. You could think how no. many people go into well before they take the medication, and while they have dermatitis or psoriasis or um, eczema, they probably already have some degree of adrenal dysfunction to begin with. Like most people do, if they're not taking care of themselves, or if they have some imbalance in their gut or with nutrient levels or their hormones, they're probably going into that with very high cortisol levels, very low cortisol levels. And then it's just adding fuel to the fire with the medication. Yeah. And the other piece to this, that's very important that I do think needs to be said, um, is that if you develop TSW, uh, what I find one of the kind of errors or mistakes that is circulated around the community is that like 
you no longer have whatever you had before, whether it was eczema or psoriasis or seborrheic dermatitis or whatever it was. That's not true. You still have that. Everything that was going on before your foray into TSW is still there. It's just now you have a really big secondary problem on top of it. And so what will happen is people will fixate on TSW, but forget what actually caused them to get there. And so they end up suffering, unfortunately. And I literally mean horrific, horrific suffering. Like I have a tremendous empathy for people who are going through this process, but they will suffer a lot of times a lot longer than necessary because the solution that is told online generally is to just wait it out. And some people are waiting one, two, three, four, five. I mean, I talked to a woman who's been six years in to TSW and she's like, I cannot with this whole waiting thing anymore. Like there has to be something else going on here. I've tried waiting and I'm still struggling. I'm still not well. And so that's the mistake is by ignoring what happened, what created the potential inflammation that drove the original skin issue and other health issues and just fixating on TSW, um, that's where the, the mistake tends to lie. And there are some things that you can do to help, um, to help, um, I would, I don't want to say speed the process along. Cause I think that's actually, uh, sets an unfair, um, expectation, mm -hmm. but can hopefully with time in a shorter period of time, lessen the impact of what's going on with your skin, with your hormonal levels and whatnot. Yeah. We definitely need to talk about that. Cause I'm sure there's some people listening. Um, and if that, if that all doesn't kind of put you off starting them or make you think twice about, um, managing or band-aiding the symptoms as opposed to getting to the root cause what we talk about the gut health the liver there's so many different mm -hmm. factors that um, the skin issues can manifest mm -hmm. as a result of so yeah definitely there's always a cause but for short term and when used appropriately they can just help to relieve symptoms but yeah could you talk us through what the approach would be I know it's probably a little bit different for everyone and depending on how long they've taken it and other health issues but what would that yes. be like yeah. So um, the first thing is I like to assess pre TSW, like what was going on before TSW. That's very important to get very clear on that. And, and for anybody listening and going, okay, I need to do that. You can go back and listen to our first episode because that'll help you do that. But then to assess what's going on with TSW, um, you want to consider any, um, any of the weird symptoms that you're experiencing for the most part are likely due to TSW. Um, even sometimes people will get these like painful nerve zingers. Um, it's just, and, and it is not uncommon to experience tremendous amount of depression, anxiety, and even some people do unfortunately become quite suicidal. So this is a pretty severe situation where you do need support. You need to reach out. I would highly recommend if you can to find someone to support you with talk therapy um, and get as many people around you to help because some people actually can't work. That's how bad this becomes. Um, so when you're assessing TSW, the, the first thing is to not just focus on the adrenal glands because the adrenal glands certainly need support. And you can do that with adaptogenic herbs, which I'll talk about in a moment that are a bit controversial, but um, you really do need to focus on your mitochondria. Your mitochondria, if they, that's your power plant, right? So if your power plants of the cells can't produce energy, there's not much the adrenal glands can do with it. So I have just found clinically, there is no research on this right now. There's no, like, that's part of the problem. This is what we're seeing clinically. I talk to my colleagues all the time. We're having conversations about what works, what doesn't work, but mitochondrial support is really crucial. Um, and it's not going to be something like just taking B vitamins. A lot of times it involves um, a, a com some sort of combination formula that's appropriate for you based off of your nutrient levels. Also getting really good um, like blood labs, looking at where your nutrient status is. And don't be surprised if your nutrient levels do not change very quickly or improve very quickly. I don't know why, but for some reason with cases of TSW, it's the process to fill up nutritional deficiencies is so much slower. And I don't know if it's that the GI tract is also just sort of like, no, everything stay out, barriers compromised, we're trying to protect the body. I have no idea. Nobody has an answer to this yet. Just be burning um, through the nutrients like- And that may be, 
and that might that could certainly be an option. Um, but just don't be. My point is, don't be discouraged if you say take. Um, you know, higher doses of vitamin D because yours is low for two, three months and you only see like a marginal bump up. Just keep in mind that the process for whatever reason tends to be slower in these individuals. Um, so mitochondrial support's crucial and then adaptogens can be helpful. So there's a lot of controversy around using licorice root, which as I don't know um, how much you've talked about that on your show. I imagine you've probably had conversations about licorice root and you might help. even, yeah, and you may use it in your practice. Um, there is a lot of pushback in this community of saying that it's a steroid and that it is basically just as bad as steroids. And there has even been conversations saying even things like ashwagandha and other adaptogenic herbs are just as bad. They're steroids. And that's actually not true. A lot of the information that's being put out there, unfortunately, is from folks that do not have any type of clinical background and don't actually understand. Like they're doing and I want to be clear, I'm not in any respect trying to be disrespectful, but it's very difficult when someone who doesn't have any basis for understanding very complex biological pathways and systems does their own research. I mean, I don't even fully understand it. It's why I also talk to people like Dr. Carrie Jones and other experts who really, really, really understand hormones. I mean, it is extremely complicated. And everything that, you know, I've talked to them, I've talked to other uh, naturopaths who also have found adaptogenic herbs helpful. I have personally found that clients who use adaptogenic herbs to be helpful. Um, I think where the confusion is, is because again, it's just trying to address TSW and not realizing that there's other factors at play and not knowing how to balance and manage all of that yourself, unfortunately. And, and it is complicated. Um, but if you have it in your head that adaptogenic herbs are like really bad for this situation, I would encourage you and invite you to revisit that idea and start to ask for where the document documentation is from anyone that puts up information that it's bad, where that's coming from specifically, because one person's experience is not everyone's experience. Um, you can be allergic to licorice. You can be allergic to nightshades, which ashwagandha is a nightshade. So you could be sensitive to them and have a problem with that. That doesn't mean all of the other ones are bad. So um, there's also a uh, dermatology group or a, an acupuncture, Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine group. They do acupuncture and they also work with herbs that do understand dermatologic conditions. And so you can find some individuals throughout the world who many of them do phone consultations that can create for you a custom blend of herbs that also can help. It's not going to address, again, the, what was going on before is a different story, but this, I found that clients that do both the um, TCM herbs and they work on these other things actually go faster in their cases. So it, it is something to consider uh, reaching out to one of these individuals um, and, and possibly um, getting a consult with them. And that would make sense to me as well, because I don't work with TSW a lot or um, my area of specialty isn't eczema and um, those types of skin mm -hmm. issues. I um, tend to work more with acne um, mm -hmm. and gut health and hormones and things, but it would make sense to me. But am I right that the theory is that um, you still need to support the adrenals and give the cortisol levels a bit of a boost and support whilst removing the more harmful form with yes. the medication, but yes. you don't want to just take it away completely and crash. So it's kind of weaning off, allowing you to wean off without it's, tanking your adrenals. So it's tough because some people cannot stay on, they cannot stay on, on steroids. Um, and so that's, that's where it's tricky. Um, for some individuals, they will opt to go on Dupixent and some other biologic medications to try to ease the symptoms. Some people will also try something called no moisture therapy. I did wanna mention really quick, I just looked it up, that if for anyone looking for the resource of who these dermatologic uh, TCM practitioners are, you can go to tcmdermatology.org. I just wanted to make sure I shared the correct um, address for that. But um, it is something that you have to, you have to, balance this. This is, it's very complicated to it's get the, the system to reboot. And the other piece to this too, is that this oftentimes looks, as I said, a severe presentation of rashes. And so this is also a cautionary tale to us 
integrative practitioners that if you are seeing someone with severe, like the skin is super, super dry, is cracking, it, they look, if you look up topical steroid withdrawal, like a hashtag on Instagram, you will see photos. So it is very easy to see photos of what this looks like. It looks very different than oftentimes a severe case of eczema. It can look similar, but there are some hallmarks um, of where like the patterns of redness go. You'll get these like red sleeves um, where almost like the redness stops at the wrist. Um, the, the, the tip of the nose will be white. Um, there are some really interesting things that you can see. And um, you just, you have to go slowly. You can't, from a practitioner standpoint, you cannot like bombard the client with loads of antimicrobials in a really, really um, challenge. You can't do that because their system can't handle it. Yeah, I do that with regular clients anyway. There's no point in going to treat the gut if their adrenals are messed up. You need to strengthen the body first and get exactly. some level of vitality. Yes, the gut might be a big puzzle piece and a big driver of the, the original issue, but as you said, there's an order of operation that you need to do it in order to get the long-term exactly. results and to do it safely. Exactly. Oh, so no moisture therapy. And again, that's another hashtag you can look up and see, uh, and, and images are worth a thousand words. Um, that is very difficult to go through, but basically it's where you withdraw moisture on a number of different levels from the body. And the idea is it's supposed to speed up the body's ability to figure out how to keep the skin barrier moisturized, so to speak. Um, and so on the exterior side of things, you stop using moisturizers, emollients, basically you stop applying anything to your skin. You shower very little and very infrequently. So if you do shower, it's like two minutes max. And it may be for like, not, you know, maybe every four to five days. I have one client right now who hasn't showered in like several weeks. Um, you a good time uh, do, when, when there's not much going on in the world, you can true, stay locked in your, or locked in your home. True, true. Um, you also are supposed to withdraw moisture from your diet. And so you're supposed to limit the amount of fluid that you take in, not only from water, but also from fruits and vegetables and other foods. Um, I would very much, there's a few cautionary pieces to this. I do find that no moisture therapy from the moisturizer standpoint, so the exterior standpoint can be quite helpful actually for many of my clients. They actually do see an improvement in their skin by doing that piece. So limiting the amount that they're showering and if they can tolerate it, um, potentially giving up moisturizers and whatnot. Um, however, I have grave concerns for limiting fluids. And I have seen people improve without doing the fluid piece of it because you can easily become dehydrated. You can watch um, or end up with uh, electrolyte deficiencies and you can end up in the hospital. It can be pretty serious. So I really don't recommend people do that on their own. Um, and then also too, uh, another piece of no moisture therapy is like making sure number one, that you are getting movement every single day, whether you're going for a walk and whatnot, whatever you can do. But one problem is that, and you will see photos of this, the people's skin starts to weep and ooze. And for some individuals, and I've, I've interviewed one individual on my podcast about this, like he couldn't even bend his elbows because the elbow creases had um, scabbed over so badly that he couldn't move the arms and he couldn't get up out of a chair in order to stand up because everything had essentially, there was wounds there that hardened into scabs and it was extremely painful to move. So this is a really this is a very difficult thing to go through. Um, but like I said, some facets of it can be helpful for people. Uh, it does help reboot the skin, but it's something you have to do in conjunction with other things, I find, in order to really get the ball moving forward. So interesting. I've never heard of that in terms of being used for eczema, but it kind of makes sense. I've heard of two separate things. So there's the dry fasting that's often used mm -hmm. in um, Ayurvedic therapies or Chinese medicine. Um, so that has its benefits in some cases, but then I've heard of the caveman regime for acne or just skin, skin health. And that kind of makes sense. But in some cases, if they need support with exfoliation, then sometimes some chemical exfoliants can be useful, but the theory is to just let the body do its thing. It, we didn't have all of these products and creams to rely on 
like even 100, 200 plus years ago. Um, we, we just allowed our body to, to do what it can and it can heal. But um, yeah, take caution and this isn't medical advice just to <laughs> no, <laughs> re- no. recap again. Um, and and no moisture therapy. Yeah, no moisture therapy is something you really have to like go in with both eyes wide yes. open. Um, like I said, go look at photos because you have to see what's ahead of you. If you decide to do this, it is, it is something that you're basically not going to be able to go to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you will look pretty Unfortunately, it's really sad. You do look pretty horrific at times and you do have to be always on guard for staph infections because that can happen. Um, But like I said, this is something that can be helpful. An NMT or no moisture therapy can be helpful for those going through this TSW or topical steroid addiction issues. Um, But again, it's using facets of them and marrying them together in a way that makes things tall. Like you have to decide what's tolerable for you Um, I think the mistake is feeling like you have to do everything. And also with, if you end up in this situation, you should be aware that a lot of times people will go crazy with their diet. They think that like they're starting to react. You might find that you're starting to react to a lot of different foods that can happen, but think about it. Your exterior barrier is super compromised. So it's not shocking that the interior barrier also becomes equally compromised. I do not recommend bothering with food sensitivity testing or extreme diet changes. I have not seen anybody who's gotten better going like super plant-based or changing it. Just try to eat as much food as you can, focusing on nourishing your body and doing what you can to support digestion and absorption and elimination appropriately. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's more important. And then trying your best to sleep. (laughs) <laughs> trying your best to allow your system to calm down because sleep is so crucial. Your skin actually has a circadian rhythm. And when we don't sleep, it actually causes um, the ability to maintain the moisture barrier to drop even further. So sleep is really, really crucial. Mm-hmm. And it's almost never the food that's the issue, especially in those mm-hmm. cases um, when the gut is just leaky and inflamed and there's infections, um, apart from things like gluten, which can be a problem for most people. Um, it's usually the the body and the immune system that's overreactive in those cases. So yeah, as much energy and nutrients as you can get, your body's going through a lot. And it is a stress doing the no moisture therapy. It's a, it's a potentially positive one in the long term, but short term, you just need, like you said, to rest, eat a lot of food, get as much nutrition as you can in. Um, yeah, but really important subjects. I've never really heard anyone talk about these things. I'm glad that you're sharing it, hopefully there's some people listening who it can benefit but some um the other thing that I wanted to circle back you told me to remind you was the biologic drugs yes Um, is that something different or have we kind of covered that no so it's slightly different and I think this is you'll find this interesting so yes sometimes people if so you're in TSW if that conversation was interesting to you if you have clients that all of a sudden this is like bells are going off and you're like, oh, I wonder if that's what's going on. It's worthwhile to assess them. There are ITSAN, uh, so I-T-S-A-N.org is another great um, organization and website to also see a listing of different symptoms for this, just so you can familiarize yourself. And as a practitioner, we have to be aware of this because a lot of times it'll look like a parasitic infection mm-hmm. or some, because it's so severe. You're like, I don't know what's going on. Does this ha- person have like pyluria or like all these other like weird rare things and it's it's this um but with biologic drugs it's really interesting so one reason i wanted to mention that is so dupixin is like this worldwide blockbuster drug for eczema specifically and i don't know if anyone really pays attention to the commercials i mean in the united states they play drug commercials like yeah we don't really have anything like that but i've I've seen them before they're on for like two minutes and it's like just rolling off the tongue (laughs) Talk to your doctor. Side effects may include yeah. death, nausea, <laughs> sorts of like some, event, some small gamut. little things, inconveniences. It does. So one thing that's interesting about Dupixin, and again, the idea here is not to scare anyone, but just to educate you. So if you're in the process of making a decision, if like your skin's is bad and you're like, maybe I should try Dupixin. One specific thing they call out is that you're supposed to alert your doctor if you have parasitic infections. It's on the front page of their website. It's even in their commercials that are aired here in the United States. And I have asked every single client who's been offered Dupixent. I've asked clients who are on Dupixent. I have asked in Facebook groups of people I don't know, but who are, you know, have eczema and whatnot. Have you ever been tested for parasites? And the answer is always no. 
And that's a little concerning because if it's such a big deal that they have to put that on the front page of their website, but no one's ever been tested, that's Mm. That's a little alarming. I'm sure if they even were tested by the conventional doctor, it would come back negative because of the, the differences with um, like the more functional and in-depth testing that we have access to. Um, but even those things, they, they often don't come back with positives. So. Right. And, and I've actually had some clients who have come back with blasto in regular stool testing recently because the doctor will look at the, stool, the GI map and they'll be like, mm, we're going to test that at the local lab. I'm like, okay, we'll do you do that. Should. And then it comes back with blasto and they're like, oh, <laughs> all right, mm -hmm. we'll deal with it. So I have found clients who've had parasites to a point where it shows up even in a conventional stool test. So my, again, the conversation here is not to scare you, but just to remind you that there are certain things, pros and cons. You should look at all of it. If you're supposed to tell your doctor that you have or don't have X, Y, and Z, but you've never been assessed for something, that might be the time to ask it to get checked for it. Because what if under the surface, because I don't, I don't know. I'm like, well, what if you do have a parasitic infection? It's not every client that has parasites who has eczema, but it's a pretty good number. So what happens if you take that drug and you have parasitic infections that are hiding under the surface. You can have parasitic infections, as I'm sure you've shared, Vivian, and not have any GI symptoms. It is not uncommon for that to happen, though I guess in conventional medicine, they expect GI symptoms to show up, which is not always the case. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, just food for thought before you go on any of the biologic drugs, and again, no judgment, I have clients that have started on them since we began working together. I have TSW clients that have started on Dupixent. I, you know, and it, it, everyone's journey is different, but you should really do your research, actually read their website, read the potential side effects, adverse reactions, who this is for, who it's not for. Have you been assessed for certain things before you dive in with two feet? And parasites aren't just a third world problem. Trust no. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. It's such a huge issue. And again, it may not manifest digestively, but it might be your mood, your skin, your um, food reactivity, period problems. They can just manifest in different ways depending on the person. Um, but yeah, doctors expect you to be having like bloody diarrhea every day or terrible gastritis type symptoms or have recently traveled to India or somewhere like that to be able to pick up a parasite, but they're everywhere. And another therapy that I wanted to ask about for skin rashes, um, whether that is dermatitis, eczema, psoriasis, would be sunlight, so light therapy, UV lights, because with um, conditions specifically psoriasis, it's even recommended in conventional medicine to go through like courses of light therapy treatment, or some people are recommended tanning beds for the management of these issues. What are your thoughts, or what is the science surrounding um, sunlight, and is it different with each condition? I would say that sunlight is important. Um, so first of all, from a very basic circadian rhythm perspective, sunlight's really important. So if you're waking up and you're just sitting in front of a computer all day, and a lot of us are still at home, a lot of people have become very sedentary as a result of what's gone on in the last year and a half. And so it is crucial to get that first sunlight in the morning to hit your face so that it helps set your circadian rhythm. So that number one is crucial. In terms of skin conditions, it's hit or miss. So for some skin issues, light therapy can be helpful. I, I think generally speaking, yes. Um, so some clients of mine have sh shown improvements with um, psoriasis in using ther um, light therapy boxes. Sometimes they'll have them in, in their homes or they'll go to the dermatologist's office. For some folks with eczema, it's helpful. For others, it's not, and it's more aggravating. So it really depends. With tanning beds, you have to be careful because the exposure, you are exposing yourself to both the, I believe it's the UVA and UVB rays that can cause skin cancer. You have to be really, really cautious and you know, I can't, I'm not a doctor, so I can't recommend or tell you to do that or not do that. Um, but I think you have to be careful because the light boxes that they use medically are different than a tanning bed. 
That said, some people can't afford the copay to go to a doctor, you know, repeatedly to do this. And so they do opt for a tanning bed as, as a result. Um, I would, I've also noticed a lot of clients do know that when they go on vacation and they go to the beach, a lot of times the rashes will improve. The only time where I would say they don't is usually where there's some sort of histamine picture present, um, or there's like a hive problem to the point where being out in the sun, some people actually do develop like a sun sensitivity. I have one client, well, she's not an official client yet, but she had done a, 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 you know, one of these client calls. She was interested in talking to me about her case, but she's really developed a pretty severe reactivity to just the sunlight. As long as she stays out of the sun, she's completely fine. But otherwise she will get these rashes that will show up within a matter of hours after being at the beach or out side in her yard. So it's not unheard of. Um, and though for people who develop hives, that's where it also can be tricky that again, that histamine overload picture, if you are really sensitive to external triggers, it can be heat, cold, your, the waistband of your pants. Um, and some, for even some people just going out in the sun can cause hives to be triggered. So I think you have, it, it's very variable. Um, most people have found that like red light therapy seems to be okay. And for some people have found it to be very helpful. It's not across the board. I don't, I don't know what, I don't think we have a foolproof answer, but I do think it's worthwhile to give a shot and to consider each thing that you do. So whether it's you try light therapy at the doctor's office or you try a red light, like find a local, maybe a tanning salon has a red light therapy or a local gym has a red light therapy box. Um, give it a shot and just say, you know what? I'm going to see what works for me. I'm going to see what improves. So take some photos of the rashes and then see over the course of several days, does multiple um, exposures actually make it better or not, or make it worse. And just say, this is what's true for me, not what's true for everyone. Um, and see what helps, you know, I mean, that's really, I think, unfortunately the best answer I can give you, but I do think sunlight is very crucial. And unfortunately we're just so conditioned to not be out in the sun anymore. Um, I, you know, in terms of, Oh, and, and I know you're going to ask me about the sunscreen, um, I do think that sunscreen to some degree can be helpful. Like, so malassezia is a different or not malassezia. Malassezia is the, the, the fungal issue. M melasma. Melasma is a different story than all of these. If you have melasma, that's different. You cannot, you have to avoid sun exposure with melasma. So that's like a totally different thing. That's where you've got to keep your face covered. You would want to use some sort of sunscreen for sure. If you, if you care, if you don't care about the melasma, then you don't, you know, there's certainly, and I'm sure Vivian, you've seen it in your practice because you deal with a lot of hormonal issues. There's a lot of hormonal implications with melasma. Um, but, it, but sun exposure is a problem. Um, but I would say, try to find, if you are going to use a sunscreen, you have to be careful applying them to like, do not apply them to open wounds, obviously. Um, and I would say if, if you have really broken damaged skin, talk to your dermatologist or your esthetician or whoever is a skincare expert who can see your skin and ask if it's safe to apply any type of skincare, whether it is natural or not, because broken skin, a broken skin barrier is just like leaky gut. You are giving access to external ingredients, right? So this external world can seep into your system and you can develop allergies, not food sensitivities. You will develop actual allergies to those. That's why we tell you don't put essential oils right on a rash because broken skin can cause you to become sensitized to those particular ingredients. Um, but I always look for something with zinc in it Zinc can be really soothing and helpful for the skin. Um, and it's also a great, uh, it's one of the few minerals um, that actually does, from the research that I have done, can actually help block the, the UV, I, I don't know if it's both UVB or UVA, mm -hmm. but that is one of the most effective uh, that is natural. There's not very many natural options like zinc. So if you'd use a natural sunscreen, it has to have zinc in it. Yeah, so the mineral ones kind of create this shield that block them, whereas the chemical ones absorbing the skin, they're the ones that are more associated with endocrine yeah. disruption and immune yep. disruption and often um, contain some not so great ingredients. Yeah. So yeah, I prefer um, zinc based sunscreen. Yep, well. absolutely. And, and just know too, some people do have allergies to minerals. Mm -hmm. So if you seem to react, not many people do, but if you do seem to react to like the zinc, 
it might be worthwhile to go back to your dermatologist or your allergist and, and, and get tested for minerals and different metals and see if you're actually reacting to them because you can have reactions to nickel, zinc, and all sorts of things. And that's sad if that was a case for you, but it is important to know natural doesn't necessarily mean that you won't be sensitive to it. Correct. And you touched on the histamine connection, which was the last thing that I wanted to cover. Um, the connection with histamine, skin rashes, and estrogen or estrogen. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So if someone notices that the eczema is cyclical, so every month they yes. might have thought that there's a hormonal connection. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I always recommend that people track their rash flares because sometimes you see patterns. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the monthly thing where I'm like, oh, maybe we have a parasite going on there. Yeah, but so many then, things to think of. Right, exactly. But if you're, if you're a menstruating woman, the thing you want to look for is that day 12 to day 16 timeframe where estrogen spikes. And if you start to see that estrogen is spiking during that timeframe, high levels of estrogen make you more sensitive to histamines. And that is histamines in our environment, as well as histamines that could be generated internally. And so um, it's not uncommon for my female menstruating clients to notice that they struggle at that period in, their, in the month. Now you can also, by the way, this is even a slight aside from estrogen, you can also be al essentially allergic or develop um, an immune response to your progesterone. That's a really tricky situation. I don't have many answers for you on that, um, but that can happen. And if you start to notice things getting worse as you get it to like the onset of the period, um, or especially like while you were pregnant, when progesterone tends to stay very high, um, that is a clue and doctors can test for that. I'm not exactly sure how I've only um, been exposed to a handful of cases in, in those situations, but it is really tricky. And oftentimes um, they're prescribed uh, birth control pills and those don't unfortunately make it better. Hmm. So just to let you know, um, but it is, it is tricky. So higher estrogen causes us to be more sensitive. It, it causes more histamine receptors to be present on cells. And then also to it deprior deprioritizes our DAO enzyme, which is in our GI tract. that's supposed to break down histamines in the gut. I have not, to be entirely honest with you, found much help for most people who test out DAO enzyme supplements. Like mm -hmm. almost no one has gotten and better. They're extremely or expensive. They're extremely expensive. And if you're allergic to pork, yeah. then it's a no-go. Um, and there's no, by the way, just in case anyone asks, there is no plant-based alternative. Um, there is technically technically you could possibly find some DAO in sprouted pea shoots. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how much DA I cannot quantify. We tried, we could not figure out how much there's even in there. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know. The, the, the key really is to assess, are you, A, do you have cross-reactive pollen allergies, right? So are you consuming foods that are possibly your body's confusing with like birch or ragweed or something like that? Um, if you know you're allergic to those things, um, is there mold in your home? That's another big factor. Do you have parasites? Parasites actually increase uh, your IgE response. Do you have H. pylori? That destabilizes mast cells. There are also cer certain gut bugs that produce histamines like Morganella and some of the Klebsiella species. Um, so you really want to go run the gamut and do an assessment of all different sorts of things to determine what could potentially be going on. Um, and then also too, do you have high beta glucuronidase levels showing up in the stool, which I know you've talked about, um, because that too is a sign that you're really having difficulty even getting, clearing the estrogen out of your system. So as a whole, usually when I have a histamine overload client, there's usually also too much estrogen as well. And I prefer to also use different things than the DAO. I've not also seen them to be clinically, um, valuable. So whether it's quercetin or mm -hmm. uh, B6 in small amounts can be good. Nettles can be mm -hmm. great as well. Tulsi, holy basil, just to calm things down. But I prefer to help people make their own DAO enzyme. There might be some genetic SNPs in there which cause it to be a little bit harder. But right. if you're deficient in like vitamin C or copper um, or you have SIBO or leaky gut, then the enzyme that's where in the small intestine it's kind of created. So there might be something blocking your no natural production so always trying to find out the root cause of the problem and it, the, from the list that you just gave of the 
histamine drivers. I feel like I had pretty much all of them at one point. The mold and the parasites yeah. were the biggest ones um, for me. And even after dealing with them, I'm like a year out of moving and doing the parasite cleansing and things. I'm still dealing with some, mine got to the mass selectivation level though. So mine was like a more severe version of that. But I would always notice with my acne, it would be cyclical and I would blame it on my hormones to begin with. But then there was a big connection with histamine as well. So it may not mm -hmm. necessarily just be eczema. It could go to hives or acne in some cases as well. So anytime there's um, a cyclical nature, then always consider histamine as being a problem. But I've got tons of other episodes because it yeah. was such a big thing for me in my health journey. But with the histamine diet, we both agree it's, it can be a useful tool just to bring down symptoms short right. term in some not cases but it, no not long term no. some of the healthiest foods ever that you're going to be cutting out yeah and it's also it's also um i think you physically feel so awful you have oftentimes trouble sleeping as well because usually issues get worse at night and then you're so limited in your diet and when it's really severe you can't even have leftovers mm -hmm. and so you have to cook everything yeah. fresh and some people and then you have to control like okay but i can't have histamine releasing foods and i have mm -hmm. to cook everything it just your life you lose the joy of food and you start to resent food. And so there's this really messed up relationship that happens with food that can cause people when they're too far down that road, um, because they've let it go too long and they've tried to just deal with it with food. Um, you get to a point where you just like, don't even want to eat anymore. And so definitely get help <laughs> sooner rather than later when you suspect you have a histamine overload picture. Cause it's, it's not, gonna go away on its own it usually just gets worse could not agree more and now that I'm in a much better place I mean I'm still reactive I still need to be mindful of my intake of some of those foods but now like looking back as to how much I had to control my diet it's crazy to think like some of the um, things that I'd like cook and I, I worked somewhere that was like 10 minutes from my home um, a few years ago and I would have when I lived with my parents my parents would bring me stuff across fresh on my lunch break so I'd have like freshly prepared meals I literally made every single meal for about three years straight and I wouldn't eat at restaurants or anything like that um, so it can become an, but I just got used to it I think yeah working from home as well it helps because I do have the ability to just make lunch fresh, but I have to think about people who have kids and who work and who have to travel and commute to work. I can see it getting um, very stressful. But again, the food almost isn't um, the pro almost isn't ever the problem. It's the body and the overreactivity. Mm -hmm. So there are so many solutions to histamine issues. It's not something that you have to live with um, long term. Absolutely. And I did want to mention, uh -huh. just to circle back a second, for anyone who thinks that like, if you're listening to this and you live in the United States and you're like, we don't have parasite issues here. There have been multiple articles. And there was one that I, that popped up into my feed like earlier this year. So in 2021, that hookworm infections persist in Arkansas. So mm. if you think we don't have a parasite problem. Literally, there are articles being written about the hookworm issue going on in Arkansas, one of the mm -hmm. states here in the United States. And that's one, actually, I don't really see hookworm issues as a problem in my practice. It's usually blasto or um, defragilis and some of these others. And, and actually, earlier this week, the first time ever I had somebody show up with really high cryptosporidium levels, I was like, whoa you need to get, we need to get you to somebody to, to get uh, some help with this. Um, but it does happen. And, and also I think people forget that if you've traveled, like, so for example, let's just pretend that, okay, you might not be able to get a parasitic infection quite as easily in our Western society or Westernized um, countries. But many of us have gone to visit places where it's, we, they don't have as clean of water and whatnot. And a lot of times they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When I went to Mexico, I, I did get kind of sick, but then it passed. And I'm like, how do you know that you cleared everything? <laughs> they're like, well, I don't. And I'm like, I, okay, well, but that's the problem. I think we forget that we could have picked things up and it might not have made you incredibly ill at the time. And little by little, by little, by little, it gets worse and worse and worse to a point where your body can't manage it anymore. And then all of a sudden you have like all these problems. You're like, how did I get here? I'm like, well, remember when you went to Mexico? You brought, <laughs> you brought something back with you. You brought friends back. So just keep that in mind if you've thought, 
how could I get a parasite? The, but you can get parasites backpacking. You can get parasites from well water. Mm -hmm. You can get parasites from touching things. Yeah, like solid leaves and things. Yeah. Maybe you have never left the country, but someone right. at a restaurant preparing your food who hasn't washed their hands after going to the bathroom, there's that Sushi. issue. Or yeah, your food being imported from somewhere. Oh gosh, and, and pork. Oh, oh you showed that awful thing about the pork, the worms. Like I have seriously, I cannot. You you like destroy. I had pork I the next. Like... <laughs> I had the pork the next meal for my lunch. So I, mean, I love it so, so much. Horrifying. It hasn't put me off, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm, I can have like shredded, but like whole pork. I like I can't do it after watching that video it. you showed. I couldn't do it. But <laughs> I was disgusted for that. a moment, but then I was like, I love pork too much. I know it's so good, but that's the thing to keep in mind. We forget, we take for granted that we don't see these things, and there's a huge problem with sushi. Um, a lot of people eat sushi. There's a huge problem with undercooked meats. Um, you know, you just don't know, and so even young children it's not uncommon to see young children pick up pinworms mm -hmm. over and over and over your if you have cats and dogs coming in and out of your house they can drag in parasites as well and they could just be on your hardwood floors and you'd have no idea so keep in mind that it it is a thing that can happen and it doesn't matter where you live and how clean of a lifestyle you live and how organic your food is you can still get parasites mm -hmm. agreed and if anyone's wondering about the video i will link that in the <laughs> if you Sorry. please don't do that <laughs> like, whilst you're eating no or, no if you have no. a sensitive stomach or if you love pork and you don't want to stop eating it but i'll link to that in the show notes along with any other links i know you give us lots of um, resources today so they will be linked in the show notes but I want to finish up like I always do with a few questions for you personally. I'm not going to ask the same ones as I did last time. So the first one today is what's something that you wish you had or hadn't done right at the beginning of your health journey? I wish that I had done stool testing. Mm -hmm. I really never did stool testing. My previous nutritionist at the beginning of my journey just recommended food sensitivity testing and adrenal testing. That's it. And I wish that I had done. I just didn't know to ask. I had no idea. And at the beginning of my skin problems, I wish that I had known to also do a stool test. So I don't have anything from the beginning that I wish I had. And how is your gut protocol going? Because in the last episode, you were saying that you were currently dealing with some gut infections and you were in the midst of treating those. Yes. So those got a lot better. I did, if for anyone who's curious, I did use antibiotics mm -hmm. <laughs> because this, the situation and the symptoms were too severe. I was having severe pain that would sometimes last up to three days. And I did have my gallbladder checked because that was the region that it was in that upper right quadrant. And they said the gallbladder was fine. There was no issues there. And so um, I also can't swallow pills. So I'm limited with what um, I can take, you know? And so um, I just decided to start with a liquid um, antibiotic and then went on to like biocidin and some other things. So that's like completely resolved itself, thankfully. Um, I do have some other weird little things, but of course I'm, as a practitioner, I'm slightly lazy sometimes and like making things happen. So um, yeah. Can, so there's can totally relate. I'm just currently going through my yearly MLT where I do, do tons of testing on myself. So I'm excited, but also a bit overwhelmed <laughs> to find the results because there's always something and that's usually how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Next question is, what's your go-to breakfast? It oscillates between a protein shake and, okay, so I used to get really sick from, from eggs. And Terry Walls, Dr. The Der Dr. Terry Walls was like, listen, you got to oh, try duck eggs. eggs. Duck eggs, yeah. You have to, be, you have to try I've duck eggs. The same. I had the same issue. Um, and yeah, I'm just obsessed with duck eggs. Now. Yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. So like even this morning, I had a duck egg omelet with, I love to saute some, or, or brown, gold, brown onion, some onions. So you get some good FODMAPs in there. I put some um, cherry tomatoes, some like cut up arugula, and then some like, I, I like ricotta or like a sheep's milk cheese, sometimes a little bit on there. So that's what I had for breakfast. So, so it's, I oscillate mm -hmm. back and forth between the protein shake and the duck egg omelet. I just, that's exactly what I, I didn't, I didn't have eggs for 10 years. And for anybody listening to this, I understand your fear because I thought the last time I had eggs, I was going to have to take myself to the emergency room because I thought I was having a heart attack. That's how much pain I was in. It scared me for 10 years. And even when I ate the duck egg, I was sitting there on the couch and I'm like, okay, it's five minutes. I feel okay. How long? And I was like terrified the well, rest of the day. Bring in on a response. <laughs> 
I know. And I was fine. And it's been so freeing. So I would encourage you if you've had, so, so I had an IgG response, not an allergy. I do want to clarify that. I don't know if you are actually allergic to chicken eggs, if there would potentially be a problem with other eggs. I don't know the answer to that. But if you just are sensitive to chicken eggs, try duck eggs, try quail eggs, try other eggs that are available, you may be fine. And it's very freeing. Yeah. Makes life so much easier. Yeah. What's something that you do daily to stay in hormonal harmony? I, so one thing that I, uh, is a big deal to me is sleep. I've started to take, I, I'm going to admit this. I I've started to take like a smidge, a smidge of melatonin at night. Like not a lot, a smidge. Like I always feel like let's do less, less Mm -hmm. better. See if we get the impact. And I just need good sleep. Like good sleep is so crucial for me. Um, And then last, when was it? Uh, Because I hurt my back last year, I really have started to exercise. So not like obsessively, I don't exercise for, I used to exercise for like three, four hours and that's not healthy. Um, but it would be like, get on my Peloton for 20 minutes and then do like 15 minutes of weight, you know, arm weights. Like I'm not, I'm not a bodybuilder, but I have to exercise. <laughs> not the technical physical... terms. <laughs> no, but my physical fitness is really important. And that also helps with blood sugar regulation and whatnot. So I feel like for me right now, my big thing is getting good sleep at night, being consistent with that and, and making sure that like about four, maybe five times a week, I'm doing something to really get my heart rate up to sweat. Um, Not so I'm like, I can't walk up the stairs. I'm in that, that sore, but just, I have to do that because um, I I just need to move. I I have to, so movement and rest (laughs) go hand in hand. Yeah. Both important for whatever hormonal um, condition you're dealing with, or if you just want to stay healthy long-term, most Mm -hmm. people know that those things are important. But very last question is where can people find more from you online? So social media, website, and plug your podcast, um, The Healthy Skin Show. I've been on that as well. So yes, where we can find you. Yes. So uh, if you want to check out the podcast, um, healthyskinshow.com is the easy way to find it. And that'll actually take you right to my website, which is skinterrupt.com. I'm also on Instagram at Jennifer Fugo. That's I, I, I'm sometimes not so good with like feed posts, but I definitely always post stories and share what's going on with me. And, um, and then I have my newsletter, but you can sign up for that on my, my website. So yeah, that's the best way to find me. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. We've covered again, a range of different subjects. I'm sure there's going to be people who have needed this information or it's maybe helped someone not face a problem that they could have done with the whole, um, steroid usage. So thank you again. And it's always fun chatting with you, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.